Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Talking Trees Live. I am your host, Katie Dubow, and I am excited to welcome in my guest arborist for the day, Nathan Baker. Hey, Nathan. Hi, Katie. How are you today? I am great. How are you? I'm doing well. It's a beautiful, sunny day here in Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, well, this time of year, I guess, is pretty gorgeous there. You've got your spring, which is probably like our summer here in Pennsylvania. Right, right, right. It's, it's currently 75 degrees, light breeze, sunny, mm. birds are singing, the trees are blooming. It's a great mm. time to be to be here. Oh my gosh, I can just picture Snow White walking through the woods now as you say it. <laughs> um, it is rainy here in Pennsylvania, but it was a gorgeous weekend. So this is a great time to ask you all out there, where are you tuning in from? And let us know what the weather is like in your area. Are you a sun emoji like Nathan in Memphis? Or are you a rain cloud emoji like me here in Pennsylvania? So let us know. I'm really excited to talk to you today, Nathan, because this is probably one of the most common questions that people ask Dave the arborist is about spring cleanup, spring checklist. We have emerged from winter in some parts of the country. It was some of the coldest winter that we experienced. And so Nathan's going to walk us through some things that you can do in your landscape this weekend, or if you have gorgeous weather today, um, that you can do yourself. Some tricks and some landscaping tips that you can get out there and do yourself, or Conversely, a couple things that you need to call in the pros to do that we suggest that you actually hire in somebody for safety reasons or for professional or for your trees. Um, so what are those tips that you can do and what do you need to call a pro? Stick around and we will get to that. So first, let me talk a little bit about you, Nathan, and your background. Um, you okay. started as a young sapling, right? I thought that was so cute that <laughs> I right. said that. Um, in 2007 with Davey as an intern. That's right. Um so I actually uh, did two inter internships for Davy Tree in their the care of trees office in Dulles, Virginia, which is Northern Virginia. Um, I loved it so much that when it was when I graduated, I decided that I, I wanted to make a career of it with Davy. That is so cool. And I know one of the things that I love about this show is that we talk to people about careers in arboriculture. So did you know that you wanted to be an arborist from a young age? So it's kind of always been a family affair with us. So um, my brother, two of my brothers have worked for Davey. Um, a third one worked for Davey in Memphis with me here. Um, so I would be number four to have worked for Davey. Wow. Um, and then, uh, you know, trees have ran in our blood for a very, very long time. I remember uh, my, my dad actually did logging down in Florida um, in, uh, I think, the early 70s. Um, wow. So we have always been involved with trees. And it's been, it really felt like it kind of came naturally to me. And I've always enjoyed being out outdoors. I've enjoyed manual labor. And then as uh, I realized this is what I was going to do, I really enjoyed playing with the big equipment. So we're talking, you know, skid steers, <laughs> loaders, chainsaws. If it's, you know, big and loud, I like it. There's an amusement park near me called Diggerland. And that sounds like something you would have loved as a kid. <laughs> um, but it's, that's so fun. And it is a career. It's a great career choice for, for people out there who've got kids who sound like Nathan, who love big equipment, love to be out in nature. There's all different kinds of things that you could do, whether it be a desk job or be a um, celebrity here on our Facebook Live series or climb a tree. There's so many different options. Okay. But we've got people checking in from all over. We've got Macedonia, Ohio, cloudy, but 70. Nice. Um, Rick is from Forest Ranch, California. The first 70s do mid next week. Very exciting. Um, Denny is from Round Rock, Texas. He says he's grinding leaves. So that's a good thing All to right. do this time of year. Speaking of spring cleanup, why don't you guys let us know what you're doing for your spring cleanup? I just got actually my Arbor, Davy Arborist was here um, yes, yesterday or the day before. And I asked them to leave me a pile of wood chips. So I was putting wood chips around my vegetable garden beds as like a fresh layer of weed block for my path. So that was my spring cleaning activity yesterday. I did 10 wheelbarrow loads full. And um, so let us know what you guys are doing for your spring cleaning activity. Um, so our landscape is waking up. For some of us, like you said, the trees are just starting to bloom. Trees are waking up from dormancy. And really the important thing about this spring landscape cleanup is to make sure that your trees have come out of winter Right, Nathan? So why are we looking at our trees? Why do we want to inspect our trees at this time right now? Okay, so we want to inspect them now because we should be seeing some activity. 
um, you should see buds starting to swell. Um, you, you should start to see uh, sap running in some trees. Um, and we need to inspect them now because this winter was really difficult in a lot of areas. In, in the Memphis area, in, in, or specifically, I know that we had one week where the temperature didn't really get above 20 degrees. Now, for some people, that might not sound too bad, but for our, uh, our landscape here, that's really, really cold. Um, and there are going to be a lot of shrubs and a lot of trees that are affected by that. Now, they may be late coming out. You might have more dead branches than normal. You might have winter kill where the entire tree or shrub is dead. So maybe that's the first thing that you would suggest. Let's jump into it. What are some of the things that as homeowners we can be doing outside in our yard um, as spring landscaping? And I have this fun little graphic while you're talking. I will show this little graphic. All right. So the first things we need to be doing, I would just kind of walk around. And then specifically, if you have big trees, um, I would look up at the trees and make sure that you don't have any broken or hanging limbs through there. First things we want to do is make sure that it's safe for you to be out there. Um, secondly, I would start to look for large dead limbs on those trees. And then, so as I mentioned earlier, you'll, you'll start to see buds swelling on these limbs. If you don't see buds on, on some of these limbs, um, that could indicate that the, the limb is dead. If you don't see bark on the, some of those limbs, if the bark had fallen off, that would indicate that that limb is dead. Um, additionally, you might start looking around at the base of trees. We have started to see some fungus activity on the base of trees that indicates root decay. And that's one of the big issues that we have down here is we have these huge, gorgeous oak trees, but they have uh, really, uh, they have the root decay start to come in there. And then you could have uh, damage in a storm where the tree blows down. You mm. could have uh, uh, other problems like that. So um, I know that I have a, is it a crepe myrtle? But it typically blooms later. I remember the first time I moved into this house, I said to my arborist, Jason, I said, it's, it's July and this tree looks dead. So are some of our trees, so if we have buds, we shouldn't cut the tree down. I mean, if we don't have buds, if you don't see buds on a tree, you know, now or as we move into April, because obviously we're all in different parts of the country. We've got Texans tuning in. We've got um, Utah. Someone just said they're from Utah. So we're all in different parts of the country. So your trees will bud at a different time. Yeah. Um, first question is, would that be around our last frost date or is that usually a little bit before then? So the uh, it could be it's going to be after your, your last frost date for sure. Um, and so like right now, I know that we currently have oak trees just barely starting to leaf out. And that's not all. I mean, there's just certain species. Um, some of your maple trees are probably starting to, to leaf out now. And then, you know, the further north that you go, the more delayed that's going to be. So sure. what, we're expensive, what we're experiencing right now in Tennessee is probably two or three weeks ahead of what you'd experience in more than the northern United States. And so if we see uh, spot something, if you see something, say something. If you, if you see a problem, don't cut your tree down or don't cut back. So is that when we should call in an arborist? Because maybe it's just the species that's budding out or maybe there's a bigger issue. Well, what would you suggest are the next steps if we see that maybe there's a bud of, you know, leaf budding out problem or that root decay like you described? Right. So one of the, the next step would be is that, Number one, don't panic. There's the, there's a lot of things that we can that can be done to help your trees. Um, you you could do it as the homeowner, or you could have a professional do it. Um, and that includes uh, some fertilization, uh, pruning small dead limbs out of there. So if we're talking about shrubs, um, you could actually go through and you can check the 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 stems on those shrubs. I use my fingernail. I use uh, you know like a, a key. You just barely scratch the stem of it. And if you see green underneath that bark, that tells you that that stem is still live. Nice tip. It will eventually come back. So I have this pruning um, picture that I grabbed. Would you ever prune a tree right here at that spot? You know, I can't see the picture that you're oh, talking you can't? about right now. Let me I'm see. sorry. It must be because you're on your iPad. So anyway, it is a like middle of the branch. So we, we do one of the tips that, that homeowners can do right now is prune small, like you just said, prune small shrubs, prune small branches. We'll get into whether you can prune branches over your head. Tip, you can't. Um, but it's kind of like the branch is long and thin and then they're cutting it right in the middle. Right, well, I actually just pulled up the okay. page and I can see what you're talking about Great. now. 
Um, and it, it's not advised to, to prune right in the middle of the, the branch because you can actually uh, end up with what they call epicormic growth or the limb could die from that. Um, we recommend pruning back to a lateral limb. You could, you, sometimes it could be called the secondary limb or a, a, a different uh, lateral there. Um, so we would definitely prune it back and not cut it off in the middle like that. Yep. Good tip. So, but I do think, you know, back to the things that homeowners can do themselves. You can, you, you say that we can do some of our own pruning, right? We can do yeah, some of sure. our, you know, tell us about some of the pruning that we should do on some of our, our smaller shrubs or our trees, like crossing branches or, you know, what are some things we could prune? All right. So just so your general structural pruning on your smaller trees can, can be done. So, you know, if it's, you know, just, you know, six, seven, eight, 10 feet off the ground, uh, a homeowner can handle a lot of those things on their own. So you want to make sure that the interior of the tree is not too crowded. On uh, younger trees in, in particular, there that a lot of times there's a strong central leader, which is what you're looking for in a tree. But you can have a lot of limbs growing off of that that middle right there, and they could become really crowded in there. And so we call it conflicting limbs is whenever there's multiple limbs that are growing into each other and they're actually physically contacting in the middle of the limb. And um, that can be a problem because it, the limbs will actually rub as the tree grows and as the wind blows. Um, and then that would create a weak spot in that limb where that limb could break in the future. Um, and then anytime you have that uh, kind of rubbing right there, it, it eliminates one of the first lines of defense of the tree in, in the bark. So when it rubs, the bark is actually getting rubbed away. And that, that's where your problems can start. Yes, that is a great tip. Um, we have a couple questions coming in. So the first one is from Sage. And I don't know how much you know about more shrubs, but she's asking about spirea. I don't even know if that's a big shrub in, in Memphis. But she's saying, is it true that you can cut that back by half every year? Do you know? So spirea does grow pretty fast. And then you can certainly cut it back pretty hard. Uh, half might be a little bit much. Um, but, you know, you could use a little bit. So, you know, maybe this year you could try cutting it by about a third. Um, and one third is tip is one of the rules that we use on pruning woody plants in general and that you don't want to take off too much of the, of the live growth in one go. But I think spirea should be able to handle it. So um, also, I'm not sure about, you know, we don't want to cut things that are blooming on old wood now. So is, do you know, spirea now is a good time to prune that? Depends on where you live, Sage. I think right. she lives in Ohio. Um, but you want it to be more dormant. Like most of our, our uh, like a lot of our plants, maybe our trees too, dormant pruning is a really good time to cut them. Right. So if it's uh, already uh, leafing out, I would I'm, I would probably be hesitant to do it. I, I try to handle these things right after the last frost and before things really start to grow and leaf out again. Um, and it seems like there's a there can there can be a narrow window whenever you're trying to do some some reduction on your shrubs. Yeah. Well, was it Rich? What was his name? Uh, Rick was talking about the forsythias are beautiful. And here in Pennsylvania, we have a little saying when the forsythia bloom, it's time to prune. And so we can go after our roses at that time. Uh, but again, that's all for a different, you know, different parts of the country. So Rick had a question. And Rick, if you're still there, maybe you can expand on this. Um, cause I'm not entirely sure what he means, Nathan, maybe you do. How bad is mistletoe on our oaks? So mistletoe can be a real problem. Um, I know we, whenever I first started working in Memphis 10 years ago, it was a pretty rare site. Um, and the longer that I've been here, the more that I've noticed it on oak trees. Mm. Um, so some of the problems that you can have from that would be, um, that, uh, it can actually kind of girdle the, the stem there and it can, it's a, so mistletoe is, is a parasitic plant um, and it can change the metabolism of that limb. It can kill a limb. It can, uh, it can, uh, sorry. <laughs> like I said, it it's not something that we deal with a whole lot. It, right. It can kill a yeah. tree. Um, what does it mean so, to be a parasitic plant? So it actually grows on the, the stem of the tree and it takes nutrients from the tree. So as the tree is moving water up and down, the mistletoe is taking that from the tree. Now, this is, is this different than the mistletoe that we use at Christmas time or is this the same it's, plant? It's the same mistletoe. Interesting. So Rick, mm -hmm. you have your arborist out, prune that mistletoe out and then save it for Christmas time. Um, he says one tree has many clusters of it. Uh, so Nathan, do you think in that case, 
I don't know. It, t it seems like maybe this isn't an issue you get a lot, but would the whole branch need to be pruned or can you kind of pull it off like Ivy? If it's really bad, you may end up having to prune the entire branch off. Um, so I would look at it. If it goes all the way around the stem, that's when it can really start to affect the, the movement of nutrients from the beginning of the limb all the way out to the end where the leaves are. Um, mm. So you could have some problems with that down there. Mm, thank you. Great question, Rick. Uh, Nathan is here live. We are live to answer your questions. So please ask them. All right, let's talk a little bit more about what we can do in our own backyard. We talked about some pruning. We talked about just first of all, getting around and looking up, checking out what is going on in our backyards. Um, what if we have spring is a really rainy time for lots of parts of the country. What if we see some standing water in our backyard? Well, that could indicate a drainage issue that you've got. Um, you know, also, if you have an irrigation system, you might have some problems there um, during the course of the winter. If you didn't winterize, you could have busted irrigation pipes in there. But you, it could also mean that you have a drainage issue. And drainage issues can be can mean a couple different things. Um, it could be a problem for your turf grass. So I know uh, we have a lot of Bermuda and Zoysia grass here. And uh, uh Fungus is a really bad problem on there. So we get brown patch, we get a uh, dollar spot, we get uh, fairy rain, things like that. And that, that mm -hmm. can really discolor your yard. Mm -hmm. um, now, as far as trees, standing water is not a good thing because there's kind of an ideal uh, soil structure that we're looking for that has uh, air and it has some moisture in it and it has the actual aggregate of the soil itself. Um, and you need all three of those components in there. You don't need to upset the balance with too much water in there or not enough water. So if you have standing water, the chances are it's upsetting that balance. The thing that I found so interesting about that standing water concept is that tree roots are just like us, like people. We cannot breathe underwater, neither can our trees root. So if you do have standing water, Nathan's saying, not only is it going to be bad for your lawn, for your grass, create mold and fungus, it's not fun to walk on, muddy paws with dogs, but it can also right. over the long term kill your trees, suffocate your trees. So that should be an issue that you should either deal with with regrading or plant more trees because they'll suck up the water. Um, all right. So mulching, that's something that we, you know, I spent the weekend or I spent yesterday doing a couple wheelbarrows full, a little bit of a different mulch. I was using wood chip mulch, but that's something that we should be applying now. Yes, it is. Definitely. Um, so one of the big things to keep in mind when you're mulching your trees is that year after year, if we keep putting mulch down and if we don't take any of it away, we might end up with a really thick layer of mulch. So the ideal thickness of your mulch should be around three to four inches at the most. Okay. Um, if you're getting to where you have five or six inches of mulch on there, you could run into some more issues to where uh, your um, the uh, soil won't, won't have that right mixture in there and then the roots won't won't be able to pick up the water like they need to. Mulch is awesome. Mm -hmm. If you have tuned in to this Facebook Live ever, you know I'm a huge fan of mulch. Mm -hmm. um, I am also anti-volcano mulching. So can you For help sure. people understand what volcano mulching is? All right. So if you think about a volcano, right? It's a peak. Um, it's, volcano mulching is whenever the mulch piles up against the trunk, the main trunk of the, the – could be a shrub. It could be a tree. And now that's a problem because the trunks are not adapted to being in the wet conditions like your roots are. So roots are, are formed a little bit differently to where when they're in the soil and there's moisture in there, they don't rot or decay uh, because of that. Now the trunks of a tree, they can start to decay if there's excess moisture from the volcano mulching. Um, volcano mulching can also uh, increase the likelihood of insect activity right there, which could basically cut off the flow of nutrients to the top of the tree right at the base mm -hmm. and then if you have that then the you could see decline in the entire tree or you could see the, the whole tree die and conversely i want to just share a little story because my arborist was here yesterday and mike was pruning some of my fruit trees now they're not that big maybe a three inch caliper but uh which the trunk size but he said you, you, oops I got, I got a little feedback are you listening to me on um the computer still? No. I, okay. Well, no, it's going on in the background. Sorry. I fixed okay. It. That's all right. Great. Thank you. Um, I, you know, it's like hearing yourself on a voicemail. It's like, if I can hear myself, I get so distracted. It's like, that's what I sound like. Um, so he said, I think you're so obsessed with volcano mulching that you don't actually even have a, enough mulch here. So the <laughs> roots were exposed around my tree. Um, now, 
so you do not want the mulch to touch your tree. But Nathan mentioned you want a three inch layer of mulch. So he took that that apple tree and he was like, look, I can move it. You should not be able to do that with a tree that's been there. You know, it's it's not a newly planted tree. It's three to four years old. And so the mulch is so important for retaining moisture, for adding nutrients into the soil over time, for protecting the roots of your tree. You know, there's so many important things of mulch, uh, for mulch, but it it's so important that you have that right layer and you don't let it touch the tree. And I just was shocked. I thought, here I am spouting the, you know, anti-volcano mulch <laughs> and I just didn't have enough on my tree. So it really is important. Rake, now, if you, you talked about your old mulch versus your new mulch, if you have a layer of three inches already, is it okay to just leave it this season or should I be raking it off and adding some fresh stuff? So I think, you know, for one season, you could probably leave it, but it's a really good idea to disturb it. So you get like a little garden rake, go through and then kind of mix it up and move it around because uh, it can actually form a kind of a, a crust that re that can repel mm. water in the middle mm. of summer. I know, I know it, my, my yard does that a lot. Mm -hmm. I have to go through and kind of scratch the whole surface up just to make sure the water is able to penetrate through there. Great tip. And one other thing that, that you could do if you're refreshing the mulch is maybe lay some compost down this time of year. Okay. Right. And that will give those essential nutrients into your soil, but you should also be fertilizing your trees. Now, this is something where I think we can shift gears, Nathan, into what you should leave to the pros, unless you have anything else you want to say we could do in our ourselves. Well, for doing yourselves, you can certainly plant trees on your own. Um, yes. You can go to a lot of different the different hardware stores, home improvement stores, nurseries. They all have trees. Um, your local nurseries will have a lot of the native species that you need. And like, like you know, we talked about earlier, that's really going to depend on where you live. So where I am, you could plant maple trees, dogwood trees, oak trees, and they would all do really well here. Um, but I would make sure you go to your local nursery and ask them what would be good to plant for the area that you've got. So some trees really like to have sunshine. Some trees really like to have the shade. Some trees do well with, with what I call wet feet. So if you have an, er an area with poor drainage, there are certain trees that could be acclimated to that and do better than others. Um, so you, the, your best bet would be to go to, uh, you know, talk to your arborist, go to a nursery and they can help you and kind of guide you and see what kind of trees you should plant. Great tip because uh, we're all spending more time at home. So having that backyard shade tree, you know, whatever it is that you want, you need to first pick the right tree that Nathan just described for your family. You know, the shade tree, the climbing tree, um, the tree that is going to absorb the water, the native species, whatever that right tree is. But then it's important to right place, right? So um, one of the things that we want to make sure is it's not interfering with our, you know, pipes or utility lines, or what are some other things about right place that we need to consider? All right. So, you know, if you also need to look at the mature size of a tree too. So yes. is it going to be a 10 foot tall Japanese maple or is it going to be a hundred foot tall oak tree one day? So with, uh, you know, those big trees, I, I would not be hesitant to plant a really big tree near your house, uh, you know, net right next to your driveway. There are some species that are more likely to have roots that run along the surface. So if you want a, a you know, a tree right next to your driveway, you might want to, you know, look, look away from maple trees because they can have roots that run along the surface and are more likely to just to disturb paved surfaces. Um, and then like we were talking about with the really big trees, you don't want to plant an oak tree you know, five feet from the foundation of your home or right next to your home. Yeah. I have this beautiful magnolia that's planted right up next to my home. So the arborists mm -hmm. were here pruning it because it's now it's, it's a big, beautiful tree, but it's just been planted too close to the home. And so yeah. unfortunately I wish it was just five feet out and it's hard to, to look at the long game here. I know because our right. trees are small when we buy them. And if you're a new homeowner, I want to urge you to look at some of the smaller caliper trees when you're planting them too. I planted eight trees and I spent a lot more money on four of them because they were five years or, or older. And then I got young saplings and guess what? Three years later, they're all the same size. So is that, Nathan, because our roots are, are spending time on our big trees just trying to get established? Or, you know, what is what is that about? So sometimes it's called the transplant shock. Um, so your more established trees have been growing in a nursery 
a lot of times they've been in, you know, bald and burlap or they've been in a container and they've been like that for a year or two. Um, and so they become accustomed to those growing conditions. But when you plant it, you know, in the first year of planting a tree, you might not see much growth when you pull it from, you know, from bald and burlap yeah. or from a container. Um, but your saplings are going to do really well be, because they've always been growing in the ground. You can even move it and it's going to have a lot more uh, vigorous growth than uh, that, you know, five-year-old tree that you were mentioning earlier. So if you are thinking of doing what Nathan said, one of the things you can do your, on your own is planting a new tree. Spring is a great time to plant trees. Mother Nature does a lot of the watering for us. It's not as hot outside. And don't be afraid to get a smaller tree because I promise you in a few years, it will be the same size as one of those larger trees. Um, and then make sure you get your, call your local arborist to make sure once you plant those trees, you want to make sure they're well cared for over time. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else that we can do on our own or should we pivot now to per call the pros? Let's call the pros. All right. Let's call the pros. What are one or you know two or three things? Where should we start? What's one thing that you should not try yourself? Um, large tree pruning. Uh, I would I would really advise to leave that to the pros. If it involves a ladder or you climbing into the tree, please leave that one to the pros. Yeah, it can be dangerous. I told this mm -hmm. story here before about a friend of mine who broke his collarbone being in a tree pruning and then six weeks later was pruning the same tree and a branch fell in the same collarbone and he rebroke it because oh, he was trying to prune over his head. So I would say number one on a ladder, no pruning and don't prune things over your head. Even if you have a pole saw, please don't break your collarbones. We want you to be safe. Arborists are trained at doing these types of things. Um, so safety is the most important, but also proper pruning techniques. You know, it's not easy to get up in that tree and make that right cut. It's not easy to make the right cut from the ground. So you want to make proper cuts that ensure that your tree stays healthy for years to come. So safety and proper pruning, call your arborist for big trees. What else? That's right. Um, I'll, I'll kind of expand on what you were talking about yeah. in that. Um, my father-in-law fell from a fell from a ladder while he was pruning a limb about six months before uh, his daughter and I started dating. This was like 14 years ago. Um, and if I'd have been around, maybe it'd have been a different story. But he fell from a ladder and actually broke his hip doing that. Um, <laughs> so it's you know definitely leave that to the pros. If it involves a ladder, definitely think about what you're doing. I'm sure you guys could all out there share a similar story. I'm sure everyone has a story like that, but yet people still try it. Please share this Facebook video. So help your friends know not to break something, pruning a big limb. Mm -hmm. All right. What else should we call the pros for? All right. So, uh, some of your fertilization you can do on your own. So like your shrubs, you could, sp you could spread, you know, a granular fertilizer, but some of your trees need that, that fertilizer to get directly to the tree roots. And tree roots aren't necessarily right there on the surface. Um, so we use um, fertilizer probes. We actually put fertilizer into water and then we inject it straight into the ground. Um, and we can get that down to where the tree roots are. Um, and it could be really beneficial because if you think about in a landscape setting, if it's a manicured setting where we go through, we clean up the leaves every year, we rake everything up, we freshen it up with new mulch, we're, and you know, we're actually at a net negative with the nutrients returning to the soil. So we're, we're doing those things like mulch to, to help with it. But if we're removing those, those leaves every year, then we're actually taking some of the, of the nutrients away. So it's important to supplement with fertilizer, um, especially for the big trees. So um, as a general rule, I advise that we use a lot of the macronutrients in your fertilizer. So we're talking about the the nitrogen, your phosphorus mm -hmm. and your potassium, those are the main mm -hmm. things that, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to say that your tree needs this, but your tree might also need some of the micronutrients, which are, you know, uh, magnesium, uh, manganese, copper, you might need some different nutrients in your soil. So if you're having some issues with your tree, you can have a soil test done um, and we perform that service for you. We come out, we collect a sample, send it off to a lab and they will send us back recommendations based on your soil type based on your, the species of tree that's growing there. So we could see what that tree needs. That is great news because I consider myself a pretty avid gardener and I've never done a soil test. I can't believe I've never done it, but it just kind of intimidates me a little bit. 
Um, so it is great news to know that too bad Davey was just here yesterday, but to know that you guys perform soil tests. I don't know if that's all um, of the the offices. Maybe someone from Davey can let us know if it's all of the offices, but certainly we know the Memphis office does does perform that soil test. And that is awesome because you don't want to be putting nutrients into your soil that you, your tree doesn't need. But Nathan made a great point. You made a great point about think of how our trees are living naturally in the forest. They get the decomposition of the leaves. So if you can leave your leaves, you know, there on the ground, you know, I know a lot of people don't like that look, but that is, that's really important. That natural decomposition won't give them all the fertilizer that they need and all the nutrients they need, but it certainly is beneficial to our trees. How often are we fertilizing? Um, are we supplementing with this deep root fertilization, Nathan? Is it every season or once a year? So on the, the bigger trees, we, we do every year. Um, and on your shrubs, we do twice a year. So we get like we, we actually use a, a granular fertilizer um, that you spread around the shrubs. We do that twice a year. Awesome. Great. OK, we're going to hide our fertilizer, man. What um, what else? All right. Anything with tree climbing, um, leave that to the pros. Um, trees can be very, very dangerous. And then anything when you're working from a height um, poses an kind of an added level so you know we were talking about making the proper pruning cuts you you might be able to reach it with your pole saw from the ground but it's important that we're not cutting into the branch collar um, yeah. whenever we're pruning on that limb so you might have to actually be in the tree to get the right angle on that cut that limb that you cut um, and I also advise leaving the, the tree pruning to the pros because you don't want to kind of indiscriminately go through and hack a lot of limbs that are on there you want to make sure that we're identifying limbs that should be removed, limbs that should stay. We can establish permanent branches, uh, make sure that we're thinning out the, uh, the structure of the interior of the tree to make sure we're not having conflicting limbs. Um, so I would definitely leave that to the professionals. So I just was quickly looking for a picture because when you say branch collar, I'm not entirely sure what you mean. So I wanted to pull this picture in so you could help people understand. Oh, I know you can't see it, but you can describe a branch collar. You've seen it. You know what it looks like. So on the trunk of a tree where a branch comes out. So if you think about it, it comes off like that to the side where it actually comes to the, the trunk or the parent stem that it's attached to. There is kind of a swollen layer where you have. Uh, two layers of wood kind of stacking on top of each other and it's going to look a little bit swollen right around where that that limb comes out um, mm -hmm. it's important to not cut into that when you're pruning it and now that's because whenever every time you you cut a tree you're actually wounding the tree um, and the tree has to expend the energy to cover that up so you know trees don't, truly don't ever heal they seal so they mm. cover up every single cut that you make and if you don't make a proper pruning cut you're making it more difficult for the tree to cover that up and it leaves it open for insect problems or disease problems from that. Now we are getting a I think so many people are confused about how to do this. Um, hence that pruning picture I showed earlier, pruning right in the middle of the branch. Jason is asking, so let's say we've seen an old cut now and it's done and it's been done and it's bad. How can we tell if is there anything to do? Can you can you then cut it back from the collar or cut it back from the branch to the collar and do a recut or what to do about a bad cut? So if it really kind of depends on how old the cut is. If it's really old, you might actually start to see where the tree is starting to cover it up. Um, you can recut that to make it a little bit easier, but I would just make sure you don't cut into any of that wood where you can see where it's covering it up. Um, you can bring it closer to make it easier on the tree. Um, but I certainly wouldn't get into any of the, the wound wood or the reaction wood. There's a lot of different things that, that you can call it, but where it's actually covering it back up, you don't want to cut into that. So Jason, I don't know how you could tell if it's a bad cut, but if you can look at this image, you can see where that last red line closest to the tree, they're not cutting the collar. So if your tree has been cut all the way up to, right? So, so Nathan, if the collar's been cut off, that's probably a bad cut because Jason's asking, how right. can you tell? That's a bad cut. You want to leave a little of the collar on. Um, conversely, if there's some, you know, part of the branch sticking out where somebody knocked their head into it, that's also a bad cut. Um, he said, does it look like a toilet bowl? <laughs> um, no. I, I mean, depends on your imagination. It could. Um, you don't want it to be, you sort of don't want it to be flush on there. Um, and you know, generally you're going to come out a little bit 
and then it's, it's gonna it, it is going to stick out a little bit um but you certainly don't want it to be flush against the tree and you don't want it to stick out you know several inches it should feel like whenever the the tree's coming down you have like the where the limb came out you want it to kind of follow that line where the limb came out and uh I don't want to say form a 90 degree angle, but there needs to be some sort of angle there that the, that the tree can cover up pretty easily. Maybe they're referring to, cause I'm trying to picture toilet seat. He just corrected himself, but as the tree grows in on itself. So as it heals itself, may, right. It's gr growing. Right. It, it, he sounds like, like he's, he's uh, talking about the, the wound wood or the, the reaction wood that's actually covering that up. That's what it, that's what it sounds like. So is that healthy to see that like donut? Yes. Let's use Danny's mm -hmm. language here. It's healthy. It's good to see that. Okay, good. Right. And that, that's exactly what you want to see. You just want to make sure you don't cut into any of that. If you have to recut anything. Okay, great. Um, thank you for those questions about pruning. Any more questions, let us know. Um, I had another question. Oh, another, I mean, certainly, I don't know if you'd be able to tell this, but an indicator of a bad cut is it invites in pests and diseases, right? So that's right. why you don't want to do that. Um, Rick Rick is asking, and I've, I've seen this done, like a painted color over the wound where you've cut. I've seen people seal that with something. Is that something you guys recommend? Um, so I'm going to say it depends. I think there's some trees uh, that maybe with, I'm not going to go too far into it because I can't say definitively, sure. but I think there's some trees you have to do that. Generally speaking, I'm gonna, and that's going to be, you know, most of the time don't, there's nothing to, to put on there. Your home improvement stores will sell prune, uh, pruning sealer and things like that, but nature does it better than we ever could. Um, and we advise you to not apply anything onto a fresh cut. Yeah, I, I agree. Obviously, I, you are more the expert, but I appreciate you saying, you know, we got to be general. It might depend on which kind of tree species you're talking about, but let nature do her job. Um, great tip. Um, Denny's saying oaks in Texas with oak wilt. That's, so, that's what I was thinking was oak wilt, but we don't have any oak wilt in Tennessee. Um, so I didn't want to open my mouth and put my foot in it. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty that's a nasty disease and there's so many beautiful oaks. So, um, Denny, call your local arborist. Um, so is that, is there any other things that you wanted to say that, you know, to wrap us up about things that we should call in the pros? I mean, we've covered so many great landscaping steps that you need to do. I think we've covered all of our cleaning up, preparing, planting, and then inspecting, which is that looking up. We covered so much more than this little graphic has to say. So um, Nathan, any final thoughts for people on their spring cleaning tasks? All right. Um, so trees can be some of the most valuable assets in your landscape. If you think about all the, the money that you spend between mulching and planting trees and maintaining, by the time you get a mature tree, it's really a quite an investment. So uh, I really advise you to uh, have the pros look at it um, that you might need, you know, depending on where it is, if it's a really nice tree in a good spot, you want to keep it. It may need a little bit of cabling or bracing. Um, you know, we install lightning protection systems in trees all the time. And basically what that is, is it's a, a copper wire that we run to a ground rod um, and we run that wire up the tree and it can help with lightning strikes there. So if you have some really nice trees, there's extra levels of care that you can give those trees. Absolutely. There is nothing. I live here in Pen you know, southeastern Pennsylvania. We have I have an 1896 home and um, we have some trees that probably are that age. They're huge, big, right. beautiful trees and they really make our landscape. Um, so I don't want to lose them. I want to take care of them. Um, in fact, we have one of the oldest ashes that my arborist here in the Pennsylvania area said he's ever seen. So, or the biggest right. ashes. So, um, of course, we want to treat that frontal ash borer and make sure we take care of it because it is so incredibly valuable to my landscape. Right. So, I, I'm so glad that you you um, you mentioned that and you ended on that because as we're looking up, you want to appreciate your trees a little bit too. That's right. Well, thank you so much, Nathan. We went a little over time that we planned, but thank you to all of you for out there for your wonderful questions. Um, and thank you, Nathan. We really appreciated your time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And we'll be back April 7th. We'll be talking about what? 
did I even, I didn't even write what we're talking about. I think we're talking about, I try to focus on one time, at, one talk at a time, but I'm pretty sure we're talking about when will our trees get leaves again, a topic that we touched on here a little bit, but come back on April 7th and we'll dive deeper into, you know, specific species, when will they get leaves and specifically what to do if your trees don't leaf out by April 7th. So join us on April 7th, 3 p.m. Eastern. And, you know, Davey has some really fun things going on. You know, they have a podcast, Nathan. No, I didn't know. Yes. Davey has a podcast. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can find them on social media and you can visit the website, Davey.com. So there's so many fun things to do between now and April 7th. But for now, we'll say goodbye. All right. See goodbye, ya. Katie. Thank you.